Once there was a Mennonite man who got himself into a little bit of a financial bind. And so he prayed to God that he would win the lottery. And he said, God, if you let me win the lottery, I will give 10% of my winnings to the church. And that night he went home and he turned on the TV and he waited expectantly for the nightly news to announce that he had won the lottery, but it didn't happen. He said, okay, well, it must be that the, not only the church, but also missions need a little help. So God, if you will let me win the lottery, I'll give 10% to the church and 10% to Mennonite Mission Network. And so um, the next day he, he was watching TV in the evening, waiting for the nightly news to announce that he had won the lottery and nothing so he said, okay, I get it. It's the, the church mission, MCC probably needs a little help too. So he said, God, if you let me win the lottery, I'll give 10% to the church, 10% to Mission Network, and 10% to MCC. And he prayed fervently. Well, the next night, he was waiting for the nightly news to announce that he had won the lottery. No such luck. And so he said, God, what's up? I, I promised that I'd give to missions and give to the church and give to MCC. And I, I still haven't won the lottery. What, what's going on? And the voice of God spoke and God said, you have to meet me halfway. You could have at least bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> so we're in a series called Five Big Questions. And each week we're going to be looking at one of these big human questions. And so the question this week is, can I know God? Now, maybe you're thinking that this, this question should really be, is there a God? But what I've observed is that most people think there's a God, that there's a God out there somewhere, that most people aren't hard atheists. They don't deny that there might be a God, but what they deny is that we can know God or that God really knows us. So God might be out there somewhere, the creator of the universe, the one who stands behind all of reality. You know, I can accept that, no big deal. But does that great, almighty, powerful God actually pay attention to the world? Pay attention to human life. Pay attention to me. And that's a, a different question altogether. And what I've discovered is that while there may be a whole lot of people who conceive of God in those great big terms, there are a whole lot of less folks who can accept that God really cares about our individual lives and situations. And that's what I think we're, we're talking about when we ask the question, can I know God? We're asking if we can know God in a personal way. And I think this is the question that maybe has gotten a little bit more pressing in recent generations. Can I know God? I think maybe in traditional societies, people have an understanding that worship and respect are due to God or the gods. And there's this kind of relationship that just goes without saying. You don't question it. But in our modern moment, as children of the Enlightenment, our relationship with traditional ways of viewing the universe has been set crosswise. And so maybe there's certain questions that kind of open up for us in a way that they didn't for generations past. Sure, God's out there, but maybe God's just the great watchmaker God who winds up the universe like this perfect machine and then steps back and lets it run. See you at the end of time. Can I know God? Now, it's not an entirely new question. Back in the Apostle Paul's time, the, that great missionary, the great philosopher, theologian of the church, Paul showed up in the metropolis of Athens, and he met the Greek philosophers of the day, the heirs to Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and he started up a conversation with them. And Paul was schooled in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. He was a follower of Christ. He had spent three years in the deserts of Arabia thinking very deeply about what it meant to know Jesus, to follow him. He was passionate. He was on fire about his faith. It's this meeting of the two worlds. You find it in Acts chapter 17. It's the world of the Greek philosophers and the, the Hebrew prophets meeting. It's the marble stones of Athens encountering the deserts of Sinai. And Paul looks around. He shows up in Athens and he looks around and he compliments the philosophers that he's talking to. He says, I see that you are very lit religious. And then in Acts 17, 18, he says um, that he starts to proclaim the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And this is very interesting because the philosophers on the Areopagus in Athens, they spend their time debating the big ideas of their day, the great human questions, not least of which is the question of the nature of God. I mean, philosophers like Plato, they believed that while there might be a great many gods like Zeus and Poseidon and Hades and all the rest, 
Behind them, in some way, was the God of the universe. Undergirding them all was the ground of being. Can we know that God? Or can we only speak of those smaller approximations of divinity that make up the Greek pantheon? And so, Paul engages them with this question on the God of the universe. So, Acts 17, 24, he speaks of the God who made the world and everything in it. Acts 17, 28, he says, In him we live and move and have our being. He's the creator God. He's the God who gives life to all people. And then Paul turns toward Jesus. This, this God who's the creator of all sent Jesus and raised him from the dead. And some of the, the philosophers at that point kind of make fun of Paul. They, they don't take him seriously. But, but Paul's line of thinking is exactly the line of thinking that we find in the entire New Testament. And it's this. If you want to know God, you have to talk about Jesus. We know God through Jesus. And you see, Jesus isn't just God's chosen king like David was God's chosen king. He's the Lord of the universe. Jesus isn't just God's chosen prophet like Moses was God's chosen prophet. He's the very word of God who put on flesh. Jesus isn't just a priest like Samuel or Levi. He is a priest forever, the priest and the offering, the one who is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And all of this is to say that if we want to know the God of the universe, we have to know Jesus. And in fact, for Paul and for others without Jesus, it's impossible to know God at all. You see this all over the New Testament. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the one who said, before Abraham was, I am, and, and uh, John chapter 8. Jesus in the book of Revelation says that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Whatever those philosophers on the Areopagus may think of Paul's claims about Jesus, what Paul was getting at is pretty clear. Yes, it's possible to know God, and we know God through Jesus. And what this means is that if we want to know what God is like, we don't start off with philosophical questions. We start with a relationship. So philosophical questions are important. Is God omnipotent, all-powerful? Is God omniscient, all-knowing? Is God omnipresent? Is he present everywhere? I mean, those are good questions, but we can quickly reach the limits of those questions. If, If God is omnipotent, can God create a rock that's too big for God to lift? Um, so, you know, we get, we get beyond meaningful statements pretty fast. But without sounding flip, I think the response of the New Testament to what God is like is very straightforward. Look at Jesus. So what is God like? Look at Jesus. God is a God who heals the sick, who values all lives, not just the lives of the powerful, who is committed to justice, who seeks deliverance from bondage, who shows the way of eternal life, who conquers death. Want to know God? Then get to know Jesus. Knowing Jesus is one of those key themes in the, for Paul, in all of his letters, and in the Acts of the Apostles. In fact, in Philippians 3, 20 to 21, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the sharing in his sufferings and, and be, by becoming like him in death, if somehow I may attain, attain the resurrection from the dead. And Paul says in Philippians, you know, he's got all of these credentials that would count to, for him to be a great teacher of the Jewish law. But he says, and you know this line, he says, none of that compares to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And we have to realize that what Paul is talking about when he talks about knowing Jesus, we have to realize what he's getting at. Um, it's something real. It's not a metaphor. And for him, for Paul, knowing Jesus is this lived reality. And I think it means a couple of things. The first is that we know Jesus in an impersonal sense. So we know about Jesus. And we can, we can read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we see what Jesus said. We see what Jesus taught. We see how Jesus lived his life, the kinds of things that he did. And in this way, Jesus is like a great role model. He is a great philosopher. If you want to learn about living the good and abundant life, then read the Gospels. Study Jesus' example. Try to, try to live like him. In the way the gospel, in that way, the gospels are, are kind of like popular biographies. You know, it's, you, people do this today, right? You buy a book about a great figure, a great politician, Fred Rogers or whoever, um, and you, you know, someone, a great figure in history who made an impact on the world, 
and you, you, you see, that's someone you see as living a life that's worthy of emulation. And then you try to glean some kind of understanding from reading about their story. What, what stood out in their life? What sorts of decisions did they make? How did they live? It's kind of like kids who idolize sports players, right? They, they want to catch like so-and-so. They want to bat like so-and-so. They kind of, they, they, they will develop like their, their same way of standing or their same way of running. They, they want to dive and catch it like so-and-so. So they try to match their mannerisms or their quirks. Um, you know, I, I heard the story of a boy who idolized a great football player so much when he was growing up that he wanted to be just like him. And he idolized him so much that in school, and he would stop signing his own name and he started signing the name of the football player up in you know, the right-hand corner, right? He wanted to be that football player just like him. He wanted to imitate the greatness he saw in that man's life. He even signed off his name. Now, there's a second sense in which we know Jesus, and this is probably the most important sense for Paul. It's knowing Jesus in a personal sense. So it's one thing to know about Jesus, but ultimately what matters most for Paul is to know Jesus in a personal sense. It's having an encounter with Jesus. And you see, in the end, of the go- at the, in the, end the Gospels are not a good idea. The Gospels are a good relationship. The gospel isn't so much a philosophy of life so much as it's an encounter with the living person who is Jesus. And I'm convinced that this is the meaning of faith. It's responding to this encounter with Jesus. Without that encounter with Jesus, then there's only dry intellect. And Paul and the rest of the New Testament think that this is possible, that we can meet Jesus, that we can know Jesus, that we can follow Jesus in the sense of a personal relationship. That's the testimony of people of all kinds and places of all kinds over the ages. It's possible to know Jesus. It's it's about this relationship with him. And this is why we spend time with him in prayer and we come to him in praise and we break the bread and drink the cup where he promises to give his life to us. We're, We're not seeking the idea of Jesus. We're seeking Jesus himself. We're seeking to know Jesus. And knowing Jesus isn't just something for people in the Bible, the kind of people who saw the Red Sea parted and the dead raised and the door of the jail miraculously broken open. It's for people just like us. They were people just like us. Knowing Jesus is something that is possible today, and he shows up in our lives often in ways that we least expect him, in ways that surprise us. A couple of us went the other day to a workshop at Valley Hope, you know, the, the local addiction treatment center, um, and Valley Hope was explaining their program and explaining their course of treatment and how it works, and it's a 12-step program. And as part of the, the 12 steps, you know, it's kind of like the 12 steps that Alcoholics Anonymous or, um, you know, Narcotics Anonymous or any of these anonymous groups use. As part of the 12 steps, they emphasize an encounter with the higher power, however you name that higher power. And one thing that was fascinating to me that I picked up on these in these presentations, is that without that encounter with the higher power, there is not going to be much progress in breaking addiction. So at Valley Hope, they have medical professionals to monitor the vitals of the patients and to help with withdrawal symptoms. They've got counselors to help the patients work through emotional and psychological issues. They've got chaplains to help them with spiritual stuff and to lead worship. But these sorts, but none of that matters unless there's this sort of encounter with God. And they have this powerful, um, this powerful, life-changing, transformative encounter. And, and those sorts of encounters with God, they're very powerful and very precious. And we got to hear the testimony of a recovering alcoholic. And he described how he had this series of unexpected God moments that were at the center of his time at Valley Hope, and that really were the impetus for him getting on that road to recovery. He said, I'm not going to tell you the details, but I had these encounters. They're very emotionally charged. I mean, he was clearly emotionally moved um, when he told us about them. Life-changing experiences, but they're also private experiences that he wanted to keep personal. But you know, that whole, the whole model of Valley Hope and the whole model of these 12-step programs requires a lived encounter with God. You know, I'm convinced that it's possible to know Jesus in this personal way, to encounter him. And part of the reason I'm convinced is because 
I keep bumping into people who have had this kind of life-changing encounter. But it's also because I've been on this same journey myself. And I've met Jesus along the way. And my mind has gradually descended into my heart. And Jesus has been very real to me. You know, knowing Jesus isn't just something that happens. Sort of like that guy who wanted to win the lottery. I was, I was actually going somewhere with that joke, right? Sort of like that guy who wanted to win the lottery. You got to buy the ticket. You got to meet God halfway. And this is why the prophet Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is why Moses told the people of Israel, Seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and all your soul. This is Psalm 105.4. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. If we want to know God, we have to seek him. To seek Christ, really. And at the beginning of Paul's letter to the Philippians, he writes that he, he gives thanks for them every time he thinks of them. And then he writes that he's confident that God will bring to completion the, the good work that God has begun in them. And Paul blesses them, and he graces them with peace. And then in Philippians, in verse 9, um, Paul, Paul says this. He says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So his prayer is that they may grow more and more in depth of insight. Now, um, knowledge of what? Insight into what? Well, into life, into truth, into the will of God, into righteousness. But above all, it is knowledge and depth of insight of God. Paul desires that they come to know Christ. He wants them to know the love of God more and more deeply, the breadth and length and height of depth of the love of Christ. He wants them to share the deep and personal knowledge that comes from a deep and personal encounter with Jesus. And you know, sometimes, sometimes God just shows up in people's lives, even though they don't know a thing about him, don't care much about him, aren't sure that they really want to meet him. It's the grand story of history, as God says in Isaiah and what Paul quotes in Romans. God says, I have been found by those who did not seek me. The Gentiles who didn't seek God found him. The Jewish people largely missed Jesus. But on the other hand, God has an extended an invitation to know him, to be in communion with him. And we're called to be still and know that he is God. We're called to discover that his word is sweeter than honey in the scriptures. We're called to take up our cross and follow him, seek God, know Jesus. And my guess is that you have had an encounter with God in your life. My guess is that there have been moments when something has happened that's changed things for you, that has shifted your perspective, that has opened a door that you didn't think could possibly be opened or maybe didn't know existed. I bet there's been a time in your life when you have had a God moment, a God encounter. And maybe you weren't sure what it was. Maybe you were not sure if you wanted to claim it. But I bet that God has shown up for you. You can Talk about that at the table over lunch. When was a time that you met God? And you know, we really have to learn to pay attention to these moments. And we actually, I think what we have to do is learn to pay attention to our own lives. And you would think that paying attention to our lives would be the most easy thing in the world because we spend a lot of time taking care of ourselves, making sure that we have enough to eat, that we have comfort, clothes on our back, work to do, some entertainment, but I suspect that we actually don't pay attention so much to what's going on in our lives. I think what, what, what's been the plot of your life? Where are the places where things could have turned out differently, very differently, but they didn't? And it can be in the triumphs, but it can also be in the low moments. Writer Frederick Beekner says, says this about tears, especially unexpected tears. He says this, they are not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them of the mystery of where you have come from and is summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go next. When have there been moments when you realized that your life was going somewhere? 
Might those have been the places where God showed up, where Jesus was leading you along his way? Can I know God? Yes. By knowing Jesus and by knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus personally, can I know God? Yes, by entering into a living relationship with him. It's about seeking God. And here's the weird thing. There's a way in which seeking God is really a kind of not seeking. The great Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard asks this, what am I to do? Ought I to get a position corresponding to my abilities and powers in order to bring this about? No, you are to first seek the kingdom of God. Ought I then to give all my fortune to the poor? No, you are to first seek the kingdom of God. But does this then mean that in a sense there is nothing for me to do? Quite right, there is in a sense nothing. In the very deepest sense, you are to make yourself nothing, to become nothing before God, and learn to keep silent. And it is in that silence that you begin to seek what must come first, the kingdom of God. In one way, seeking God is about putting ourselves in a position where we can be open to God seeking us. It's not like other kinds of seeking where we look around until we find what we want and then we grab it. It's not like trying to find the keys in the couch, couch cushion. Seeking God is being open to God's seeking us. And this is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. This is why Jesus great, one of Jesus' greatest parables about seeking God, the, the good and loving Father, one of Jesus' greatest parables was actually a parable about being sought. In Luke 15, the, the parable of the prodigal son, you know, that son who takes his inheritance and goes to the far-off country where he loses everything and ends up uh, hungrily um, looking at the food of filthy pigs. You all know that story well. It's then and Jesus says in this story that at that low moment, the son comes to his senses and begins his journey back to the father. And while he is still a long way off, the father sees him and runs to him and embraces him and welcomes him. And Jesus was saying, this is what it looks like to seek God. This is how our father acts. You have to come to your senses and turn to him. Yes, but ultimately it will be the father who runs to you who embraces you, who welcomes you. We love God because he first loved us. Can I know God? Yes. It's not a knowing that will happen all at once in an instant. It's the knowing of invitation, the knowing of relationship, the knowing of walking together along the long road. But you gotta buy the ticket. You gotta meet him halfway. Like Paul, this is, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And I pray that you will meet Jesus on your journey and grow in knowledge of him. Thanks be to God. Amen.